Today we are introducing our word for the year. Every year I like to introduce a new word. Uh, what I believe God has laid on my heart for our church and for our people. And uh, many of you never heard the words that we have had in the past. And so our church started in 2016, but we started in March of 2016. So um, I didn't necessarily give a word for our church that year. Honestly, we were just trying to get off the ground. I mean, at that point, we were, we were in survival mode, just trying to get things going. But in 2017, the word that God laid on my heart for our church was become. And our church had just actually went through a mini little church split at that point. Uh, we were running 40 to 50, and we had about 15 people leave, so we were right back down in our 30s. And uh, I remember that was like a, a make-or-break moment for our church. Uh, I think that our church could have easily went under at that point. In fact, a lot of church plants don't survive to year five, and we're, we're one of the few that has survived to year five, and I'm thankful for that, for God's uh, gift to us with that. Um, but in 2017, I, uh, I remember delivering that word, and that, that year was rough because we had very few visitors uh, attend our church. That's kind of a, a sign on how your church is doing is how many visitors are filtering in. Uh, and, and obviously you want to keep the visitors that filter in, but if you have no visitors filtering in at all, that's not a good sign. That's a sign that your church is, is heading towards decline. And so, but that year we had like hardly any visitors. But I kept going back to our word, which was become. Wasn't necessarily that God was telling us to focus on trying to grow the church numerically at that point. It was about the people in our church becoming who God has called us to be. And most of the people that were a part of our church at that point, they have formed the core of our church today. People that have formed the foundation for those of you that have attended since 2017, since 2018. Uh, they have helped form the foundation that you're now building on, and I'm thankful for those people. In 2018, our word was believe, and uh, so I delivered that word in January, and about midway through the year, we started to figure out that it might be working out for us to receive this building that we're sitting in today. And I remember people telling me uh, when we were very early in discussions that it's never going to happen, and I just kept going back to our word which was belief, that I just had to believe that it was going to happen, that we had to believe that it was going to happen, and it came true. You're sitting in, in the building that God has blessed us with today. And so, obviously, when we're bringing two churches together, we're moving to a new location, uh, that's some big cultural changes that the church can go through. And so, for 2019, our word for that year was move. Two churches merged together, and those two churches that merged together needed to move towards one another, but we needed to collectively continue to move towards Jesus. And I know that a temptation, when you have a building like this, there's that temptation for the church to stay within the four walls and not move out into the community. And so part of that word for that year was about moving out into the community, continuing to be a community-oriented church to show the love we have for the people that God has called us to minister to. In 2020, our word was mobilize. And boy, did that word, uh, was that word appropriate for our church and really the church in general. Uh, when I delivered that, it was, uh, I was focusing more on us sending the church out to do ministry Little did I know that we would literally close a few weeks later and we would be mobile because of the pandemic. Uh, we closed from March to June and we were all mobile, <laughs> really, in different locations, uh, but still, thankfully, doing ministry. Uh, and so that word was very appropriate for that year. Uh, I just didn't know that we would literally have to mobilize the way that we did. Uh, and then last year, you know, last year we went over this word last week. Last year, our word was more. And we talked about how we need more of God. We must give God more of ourselves. And that God wants to do more through us. And we have seen that take place. So as you can see, our words for each year have been very uh, crucial, have been very uh, consequential for our church. And I believe this year is going to be no different. 
And so here is our word for this year. It is multiply. Multiply. Now, you might be thinking, that's a math term. Are we getting ready to go to school? Yes, we are. Um, this word has actually been on my heart for a few years because multiplication has been a goal for our church for a long time. And so I actually came into last year, uh, as I started to seek out the, the word for the next year towards the end of the previous year, uh, I came into last year thinking that this was our word for 2021. And it was like a few weeks before I was going to have to preach the message that God told me, no, it's not time yet. Your word for this year is more. Well, this year I came in with this word again, and God never changed it. And just looking at the dynamics of where our church is at, I can see that this is something that could happen within the next year or so. And so today, I'm going to give an overview. I'm not going to go too much in depth with this, so you might, be, you might not get necessarily too much out of today's sermon, um, because I'm going to dive into it more in the next three weeks. I Honestly, guys, I'm, I'm not going to be surprised if we're going to have to close over the next few weeks because of COVID or because of snow or because of something else. So uh, everything over the next month, two months, we're just kind of taking each week as it comes. But if everything works out over the next three weeks, I'm going to talk to you more and explain this in more depth. But today is going to be an overview of this word and how it applies to our church. And so let's first start with a definition. And this is not the definition you're going to find in the dictionary. This is the Nathan Kaiser definition. Uh, to multiply, I'm going to define for our church as to make more who make more. To make more who make more. And I am intentionally using the words from last year because just in life, just as it is in life, it's the same way in our church. You build off what you've done in the past. And so last year our word was more. And so I wanted to take that and, and use it with multiply here. So to multiply is to make more who make more. Now let's start with addition. Addition is to make more. So I'm just going to go, we're just going to do a little math here. We're going to start with one. And this one can be whatever you want it to be. It can be one person, it can be one sale, it can be what, whatever you want it to be. Let's start with one. And let's go five levels out here to see what happens through addition. So if that one makes one more, then you have two. And then if that one makes another one, you have three. That one makes another one, you have four. That one makes another one, you have five. That one makes another one, you have six. That's addition. Now let's talk about multiplication to make more who make more. So once again, let's start with that one, and that one reproduces itself. So that's all we're doing, is that these are going to reproduce themselves. So one goes to two. All right, now, so that one has made one more. But now with multiplication, what happens after this is those two make more. So one to two, if those two reproduce themselves, then you have two to four. And then those four reproduce themselves, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32. That's not pretty at all. Anyway, uh, 16 to 32. That's five levels of these. This is multiplication because the, ones that, the one that made more, those then make more. Here, that one just keeps making one more. Here, they make more. And as you do that, you grow quicker. So look at the difference between 32 and 6 is 26. So just at the fifth level, the fifth generation, so if these are sales, and this, this one sale has to just continually make one more, then you have six sales total by the end. But if it replicates, if it reproduces itself, so that one sale produces two more, those two more produce four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, then you end up with more sales by the end, by the fifth level. And so how does this apply to the church? 
I, I wanted to be a math teacher when I grew up uh, I, for a long time until I got my call in the ministry. Uh, I love math, and so talking about multiplication, talking about uh, math in general is something that makes me come to life, but it really makes me come alive when I think about it with church. How does multiplication apply to church? Well, let me start with this statement. The churches that most of us have been a part of throughout our lives have mostly focused on addition when Jesus and the early church was all about multiplication. Think about what is the dream or goal for most churches? The dream goal, the, the dream vision for most churches is for them to add as many people as possible to their church. To add as many people to this location, to add as many people to this building, to add as many people to this family. And eventually most churches look forward to having to build new buildings, start two services, they want to become a mega church. They want that big budget. They want a ton of people. They want the seats filled. And most of the time in those churches, the churches that are actually growing, that growth is built around, a lot of times it's a charismatic speaker. Their, their pastor is someone that people enjoy listening to, people enjoy following. Uh, most of the time that growth is built around a charismatic speaker that draws people in and it's really that one person continually adding to the church and there are some people that can do that there are some people that are better speakers than I am that are just fantastic at, at gathering a crowd and in these churches there is some discipleship going on within this church but typically these churches grow to be large and some grow to be healthy while others do not. And when I talk about healthy, you can have a large church and not be healthy. You can have a small church and be very healthy. Health is determined by how many disciples are being made. And something that I think is a, a temptation, especially in addition-minded churches, is that many people tend to think it's not their responsibility to make disciples so they let the pastor or that charismatic speaker or the leaders or the designated teachers or whatever they let the designated people be the ones who are making disciples that's addition you're leaning on that one person to just keep producing and most churches i will say our church included has started out with addition at least. I mean, you really had to do addition before you get the multiplication to some degree. I think God is calling us to shift our focus. And what we're doing is we're shifting our focus to what God has been about the whole time. God is all about multiplication. And I want to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 to show you this. Let's go back to Genesis 1. Let's talk about the plants. God said... Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it according to their various kinds. That's not addition, church. That's multiplication. He says, let's let the land produce seed-bearing plants. So a plant comes up, it produces a seed. That seed then goes to the ground, produces fruit, and that seed goes to the ground, and it produces another tree, another plant. I was looking outside my window as I was going over my sermon on Friday, and I was thinking, how crazy would it be if all these trees only could produce one other tree in their lifetime? That's addition. How crazy would that be? But no, I'm thankful that these trees can produce who knows how many trees in just one season because of multiplication because those seeds can then produce more seeds that produce more seeds that produce more seeds you cover more ground you cover more area he did the same thing with the uh, animals in verse 22 god blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply i used the nlt version because it had our word in there he told them be fruitful and multiply let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth multiplication was what God desired for the animals to do. And luckily, the same thing with humans. God told us to be fruitful and multiply. 
fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Can you imagine how long it would have took for us to fill the earth and govern it if we had to stick with addition? But luckily, God made a way for us to multiply. And if you need to know what that way is, you can ask your neighbor. Um, <laughs> Jesus was about multiplication. In Matthew 4, 19, when he called his disciples, here's what he said. Come, follow me. That's addition. That's Jesus asking them to follow him. And so his number went all the way up to 12. But then Jesus said this, I will send you out to fish for people. That's multiplication. He said, he could have, he said, he, he said follow me. I'm adding you to this group. But then he says, I want you guys to then go out and make disciples yourself. I'm going to send you out to fish for people. Jesus made more disciples who he then sent out to make more disciples. Jesus didn't settle for addition because he knew multiplication was the strategy that would reach the most people. And we saw him implement this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 8. It says, the twelve Jesus sent out with the following destructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who, those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He sends them out to do ministry. And I wanted to read all of that because he didn't just send them out and say good luck. He sent them <coughs> out to do ministry work. And I want you to catch this. Jesus didn't do all the ministry himself, so why do we expect pastors and church leaders to do it all themselves? Jesus didn't do all the ministry himself. He knew that he could reach more people by sending the people he has called to follow him out to do ministry. And he gives us the same call in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Notice Jesus did not say that he would go out and make disciples of all nations himself. He says, I want you guys to go out and I'm going to be with you as you go out. Multiplication. Multiplication is what Jesus believed in. He did not believe in addition. He believed in, in calling people to go out and to make disciples. He made more disciples who he sent out to make more disciples. And it's no surprise that we see the early church following in with this pattern, partly because they were forced into it. We read this verse last week, uh, but we're told at the end of Acts chapter 2 that there were 3,000 people added to the number of Christians that day. So Peter preached, a bunch of people responded. And the disciples, I believe they knew that they were not called just to, to gather a crowd. I think the disciples, the apostles, they knew they were called to make disciples, and so they knew that's what they had to do. But there would have been no way for it to have been done if they didn't take a multiplication approach. And I had to make that really big because I'm not going to be able to see it if I don't. So Peter, Jesus told Peter, he was the rock on which the church would be built. The church grew to 3,000 people on day one, basically. That's crazy. So if Peter, that one person, was responsible for discipling all 3,000, that is a horrible ratio. 
There is no way Peter could have discipled 3,000 people. Can you imagine how many conversations would that take place? Can you imagine how many stories he had to hear? Could you imagine how many burdens he would have to carry? How much compassion he would have to have? There is no way he could have discipled all 3,000 people. So let's go to the 12. Let's say that it's the 12 apostles. 12 to 3,000. What's that ratio? If Randy was here, Randy's sick today. If Randy was here, he'd probably be able to do the math for me just like that. It's a one to 250 so one person would have to disciple 250 people that is not a good ratio if you had to invest and disciple 250 people there is no way you're going to be able to do that and do it well yet we have churches of 250 people where people expect the pastor to disciple all 250 so tell me those churches are healthy when they're structured in that manner Let's talk about the 72. Jesus sent out 72 disciples uh, in the Gospels at one point. And so that ratio is going to be roughly 1 to 42. So that's getting better, but it's still not great. Now, on Pentecost, there was 120 disciples, 120 believers in the upper room at the time when the Holy Spirit fell on them, we believe. And so that ratio would be 1 to 25. And that is better, but it's still double of what Jesus himself intentionally discipled. Now Jesus, he built a close relationship with 12 disciples and then he built an especially close relationship with three right. he had other followers he had 72 but here's what i believe i believe that jesus discipled the three. the three helped disciple the 12 the 12 discipled the 72 the 72 discipled the 120 and eventually you had a a, a group to do ministry when these 3,000 get saved, that 1 to 25 ratio is a lot better than the 1 to 250 ratio. Still not great, but you could have a group of 25 and probably disciple them pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. Let's look at the way that the early church had to multiply. We kind of see the numbers here, and we're going to get to this in a second about discipleship. But we saw the church, the early church was forced, really forced into multiplication because of their rapid growth. This, this would not have worked, this would not have worked, this would have worked maybe, but not great. But we see that the early church had to embrace multiplication, and I want to look at three ways they embraced it, and we're going to look at disciples. Uh, I want to look at three ways they embraced it, and as we look at three ways they embraced this multiplication approach, this is how we've got to embrace it in 2022 as well for our church. And so I'm actually going to take this away because I need a blank sheet. The first way we see the early church taking this multiplication approach because of their rapid growth is we saw that they multiplied their commitment to God. And so number one, we must multiply our commitment. Commitment. I'm going to draw some circles here. I'm just going to draw one right now. We must multiply. I'm just going to do C-O-M. Yeah, we're just going to C-O-M. We must multiply our commitment. We saw them do this in Acts chapter 2, right after we're told that 3,000 people were added to their number that day. We're told that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and held everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And here's the key part. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They multiplied their commitment in ways that we, I don't think we in America have ever seen Christians be this committed to following God. 
I don't think we have seen this, but I know it happens in other places in the world where Christians are literally giving up their life to follow Jesus. But after they've added all these people to their numbers, we're told that those people, they devoted themselves to listening to the apostles teach and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. So they were together. We're told that they were together daily. They met together daily and ate together. They broke bread in their homes. And ultimately, one of the things they did was that they sold everything they had and gave it to the church. That is radical, church. They basically said, my house is your house. My belongings are your belongings. Here, we hold everything in common. There's going to be no one poor among us because we're all going to give to one another. This might sound weird, but it's, it's, it's somewhat where the idea of socialism comes from. But the bad thing with socialism is it's forced on you. This was not forced on the church. The church had this such a radical change of heart that they gave everything up for their brothers and sisters and for Jesus. They multiplied their commitment in ways that we have never seen. They devoted themselves to caring for others to the point of giving up all of their belongings. They devoted to learning more about God. They, de they devoted themselves to connecting with others, to doing life together. Their commitment multiplied versus what it has been. And that is crazy that we see that happen in, in Acts chapter 2. But because we see that happening, I believe that's why the church continued to grow at the rate it did. And so church, what we have to do as we uh, talk about multiplying our commitment, I'm not going to go into too much detail with this, but I'm going to bring back up our discipleship process. As God is calling us to multiply our commitment in this new year, we must, number one, connect more. We must connect more with God, connect, connect more with one another. We cannot neglect meeting together. Uh, we were going to start table gatherings up here in a couple of weeks. We're actually going to move that back to February. I'll tell you why at the end. Uh, but I want to encourage you, get in a table gathering. If you've never been to one, I think you would enjoy it. Uh, it's just a time where we get together and we seek God together, we do life together, we talk about prayer requests, we talk about the Bible, and we just have this, this general supportive, encouraging discussion with one another as we push each, on, each one another towards God. And so that's the place where really we, we grow in our commitment, yes, but we, it's a place of connection as well. But number two, we must commit more. We must give more of ourselves to God for some of you, that may mean actively serving him in your life in ways you never have before. It may mean giving more and more of your life over to him so that he can clean it out and purify us from all sin. Whatever that means, this is the year to do it, to multiply in our commitment. And number three, we need to multiply how much we care about others, how much we care about making disciples. And as we head into this new year, I think it's important for all of us to realize we all have room to grow right. none of us has arrived none of us are perfect and so we need a renewed commitment to pushing to serve God more in every area of our life to multiply our commitment to him to love him with all of who we are and to love others as we love ourselves the next level I want to talk about that we are being called to multiply, that we saw the early church multiply, is disciples. Disciples. We saw that take place in Acts chapter 2. They uh, grew rapidly that day, and that required them to actually disciple those people. And I believe the evidence that they actually discipled those people is found in Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Many who heard the message believed that so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. As I said last week, that's just men. That's not counting the women and, and the children or anybody else in, in the household necessarily. So their number had more than doubled or probably more like tripled or quadrupled. Just then, we don't know how much time has passed. But two chapters later in the book of Acts, this, the church is growing rapidly. And I believe the church grew so rapidly because they were making disciples. We saw that at the end of Acts chapter 2. 
That is them making disciples of the new believers. And so as they grew, they needed more people to make disciples and to build relationships with people. They needed more people to actually invest in the lives of other people to help them learn about this, this Jesus fella that everybody's following the way. That's what the church was called at that point was the way. They needed to teach them the way because they had no clue what the way was. The church was brand new. And so you needed people who were going to intentionally disciple other people. And so as we move into 2022, I believe God is calling us to multiply disciples. I think God is calling you to invest in the lives of other people, to reproduce yourself in the kingdom of God, to teach and point others to Jesus. That's the call that God has placed on every one of our lives is to go and make disciples. And I think in 2022, what we're going to have to be is we're going to have to be intentional. No more of this, well, if it happens, it'll happen type of thing. We have to be intentional about developing relationships with others and discipling them into a closer relationship with God. And what I hope to give you during this series is the tools to help you do that. Our denomination has produced some really good resources to help us make disciples, uh, who then actually go make disciples. Um, our, our denomination believes in multiplication, believes in the multiplication approach. One of the goals of our denomination is to have a, a church or a life-transforming influence in every zip code in America to go and have a life-transforming presence in every zip code in this area and beyond as we seek to bring people into the kingdom of God. And I'm thankful for that vision. But that starts with, number one, us multiplying our commitment. As we multiply our commitment, we are going to multiply disciples, but then that leads into the third layer, and the third la layer is churches. We must multiply churches let me show you what the early church they fell for the trap that churches today actually still fall into um i'm gonna go back to what jesus told them in acts chapter 1 verse 8 uh because i want you to see the instructions he gave them he tells them you will see power and the holy spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth so jerusalem was like where they were, he told them to stay. That was their immediate location. But he told them that they're going to be his witnesses in all Judea. So that's outside of Jerusalem. But then he says, and Samaria, which goes a little bit further out. And then to the ends of the earth, which obviously goes further out. But yet, in the first seven chapters of Acts... Where has the church stayed this whole time? In Jerusalem. The church never really expanded to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth until the church started to, to be persecuted by Saul, or later Paul. Until the church was persecuted, until Stephen was killed in Acts chapter 7, the, ch the church never really multiplied itself. Basically, the church in Jerusalem was growing by addition at a church level. But in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, and I think it's very interesting that it's Acts 1-8 and then it's Acts 8-1. In Acts 8-1, we're told a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout where? Judea and Samaria. It wasn't until the persecution came that the church multiplied at a church level. They were multiplying their commitment. They were multiplying disciples. As Dennis and Sandy have said before uh, about churches, but I see this there, that church was pregnant. The church in Jerusalem was pregnant needing to reproduce and it wasn't until the persecution came that it forced them to reproduce 
It forced them to scatter. So now you have these Christians scattered all throughout Judea and Samaria. And guess what the very next part of that chapter is about? It's about Philip making disciples. Churches were created because of the persecution that they experienced because it it cost them to scatter. The church multiplied. They multiplied their commitment, number one, in Acts chapter 2. They multiplied disciples as evidenced by Acts chapter 4. And they multiplied churches in Acts chapter 8. Today, we still need our churches to multiply at a church level. God still wants us to start or plant other churches. Let me throw some stats out to you. We actually need more churches to reach more people in America. So every year, and this number is pre-COVID, so it's it's worse both ways this year. Uh, Every year, about 4,000 churches are planted. That number was probably really low because I would not have wanted to plant a church during the middle of a pandemic last year or this year. Every year, about 4,000 churches are planted, but 3,700 churches close. So, doing math there, that's a net gain of 300 churches a year. Guarantee you, those numbers are worse because of the pandemic. Because there are more churches closing, less churches starting. Just that net gain, so let's go best case scenario. Just that net gain of 300, that does not keep up with the population growth that we are experiencing in America today. And to, so just to keep up with population growth, we need to triple our church planning efforts if we ever want to have a chance of reaching the people of America. We need to plant, uh, not just our denomination, this is, this is the church in general, we need to plant 12,000 churches a year just to try to catch up by like 2050. That is crazy, church. And yet what frustrates me, and I'm a church planner, so I think I think about this often, is that there are very few churches even interested in multiplying. There's very few churches even thinking about it. It's not even on their radar. Instead, they want to build their kingdom at their church. They want to add people to their church. They want a bigger budget. They want to build the bigger building. They want a bigger crowd. They want the popularity. I don't know what it is. They want to build their church. And we have a lot of churches around here that are pregnant, that are needing to reproduce so that we can reach people in other areas other than our own, so that we can build God's kingdom rather than our kingdom but that takes us having a kingdom mindset if we plant more churches in more places then the kingdom of god grows that much more and let's just use our church as as an example if we were to plant a church which is one of our goals one of our long-term visions if we were to plant a church somewhere other than seagrove then our church your money your effort your commitment to god Uh, The people that you discipled, they're going to be discipling people in other places, in other towns, other than ours, where we, here in Seagrove, can't reach those people. We're going to them rather than expecting them to come to us. Let's say God calls us to to go to Star, or let's use Bennett, over in Chatham County. Let's say God calls us to go to Bennett. I don't know of anybody around here that necessarily drives from Bennett. But if we send a a group out from our church to go plant a church in Bennett, to go minister to the people in Bennett, we're multiplying our impact. We're not just impacting the people here in Seagrove. Some of you drive from way on up somewhere. We're not just... We're just not reaching the people in this area. We're reaching people in other areas through multiplied commitment, multiplied disciples, and multiplied churches. We're able to reach those in our Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. The early church had this multiplication mindset, and because they did, they experienced some great and big things. I wonder what our churches have missed out on because we have had an addition mindset. 
what the church has been doing isn't working as well as it could. And I was going to give you a bunch of stats from uh, studies done, but I'm just going to ask you this. How many churches have you heard of just in our area that is on their last leg? How many churches in our area have you heard have had their attendance cut in half pre-COVID, since pre-COVID and they're barely staying afloat? I know of, of, I can think of four or five off the top of my head right now in Randolph County within just a few miles of us. There are churches who are going to be closing in the next 10 years. I actually saw a study that said the typical lifespan of a church is 80 to 100 years. Churches are like living organisms. They are born, they live, they die. They're, they believe, so 80 to 100 years ago, we had some of the most churches planted ever in America. If that lifespan is about right, those churches are going to die here in the next 10 years. That means that we need more churches being planted to fill in the gap where these churches have died. Our strategy must change. I think we need a multiplication strategy. But here is why I think a multiplication strategy is something that we don't initially think about. It's because it doesn't seem to make sense, at least at first. Because for multiplication to happen, it requires subtraction. My next point for you is this. To make more who make more or multiply, we have to give more. Jesus lived this out, actually. This is something that came to my mind that I wanted to point out. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 16, verse 7, that he says, it's actually good for you that I'm going away, subtraction, because unless I go away, the advocate, is the capital A, so that's referring to the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says, I have to be subtracted from walking the earth so that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, can come be with you. And actually, the Holy Spirit lives in all of us. The Holy Spirit's kind of, uh, you could say, multiplied. Uh, the Holy Spirit is in all of us and working through all of us. And so we see Jesus saying, hey, I've got to be subtracted from walking the earth with you so that you can gain something. You've got to give me up. And because you give me up, you're going to gain something. You're going to gain the Holy Spirit in return. We saw, we see this in the commitment disciples' churches. What did the church have to give up with commitment? Well, they had to give up more of their lives. They had to sacrifice more. They had to, they had to give up their possessions. They had to give up their desires. They had to give up their time, their effort. They gave everything up to follow this Jesus. And that's what God's calling us to do in 22 as well. To give things up to multiply, to give it to him, to multiply what he does through us. Disciples, they had to give up time. They could have been doing whatever. They could have been watching Netflix in Acts chapter 2. But instead of watching Netflix, they're going to disciple other people. Church, we have got to give up some of our time, some of, our, uh, 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 in, some of the things we enjoy in life even, and we've got to invest in other people. We've got to make disciples, but that requires us giving up a little bit of ourselves for the sake of other people. And then finally, for churches. For us to plant another church, you know what we're going to have to do here at this church? Give up some of our people. Yeah. We're going to have to say, okay, we're willing to lose 15, 20 people knowing that we're actually not really losing them. We're just giving them the God to use somewhere else. But so many times, multiplication doesn't happen because it requires subtraction. And in American culture, we don't like giving anything up. In American culture, we don't like to lose anything. And it doesn't make sense. So we just don't do it. But we're not called to have American values. We're called to have kingdom values. And in the kingdom of God, the way it works, when you give something up, you're giving it to God. 
And in God's economy and the process that God uses, when you give to God, you lose nothing, but you gain everything you could ever need. When you give to God, you lose nothing, church, because you never can outgive God. How could you? He's given you your very life. And as you give him more of yourself, he will do more in and through you than you could ever ask for or imagine. Because as you give more of yourself to him, you're going to get closer to him. And as you get closer to him, you discover that he is everything you could ever need. Because he has unlimited resources that he has given us access to because he is the creator of all things. And so as you give more, you're going to see God work through you more. You're going to see God work in your family through through your family, through your church. You're going to see him use you to grow your kingdom, but you have to give some things up. You've got to give some things over to him, starting with your commitment. You've got to give more of yourselves to him, commit more to him, commit to making more disciples, and then when God calls our church to give up some people, yes, we're going to give up some people, but we're going to give them to God, and God's going to use them in greater ways than they could ever ask for or we could ever ask for or imagine. Because it is his power that is at work within us. When you give to God, church, you're losing nothing, but you gain everything, but it requires you to give something up, and we don't like doing that. Because it doesn't make sense. Giving up in order to gain, it takes faith. Faith that giving up something doesn't really result in losing something. That doesn't make sense. That does not compute in our head. But yet that's the way it works in the kingdom of God. Well, you've got to have faith that God's way of multiplication is better than our way of addition. That God's way of us actually giving something up actually results in more for us and for other people. We've got to have faith even if it doesn't make sense. And we've got to do it because he asked us to. And so my question for you today as we kick off 2022 is this. What is God calling you to give up today is he calling you to give up more of your life is he calling you to give up some of your time to disciple other people then is he calling our church to give up some of our people to plant another church this year That's something we're going to explore together in this series through this year. As we seek to multiply. And here's what I believe, church. I believe how we respond will determine what God does this year and beyond. If we multiply our commitment, we will multiply disciples. And we will multiply churches. But if we don't, if we don't multiply commitment, we'll never multiply disciples, we'll never multiply churches. How we respond determines what God does this year for our church and for you and beyond. And so I pray today that we will respond obediently, that we will respond boldly, that we will respond in faith, knowing God's ways is greater than our ways. And that we will respond intentionally to see what he wants to do in and through our church in 2022 and beyond. Amen.